it's quarter to 12 nigeria we either get it right or we fall off the brink welcome to another edition of quarter to 12 my name is Adria ahmed and my guest today is leading journalist and undoubtedly in my view the foremost political commentator in nigeria he is also the publisher of one of Nigeria's leading online newspapers, The Cable, Mr. Simon Kolawale. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, Simon. I know you don't do press. <laughs> 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 so I am extremely <laughs> grateful that yeah. you said yes to my request to come and have this political conversation with me. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're in political season in Nigeria yeah. um, in about six months. The country will be heading to the polls February 2023 for national elections. We'll be electing, among other things, president and vice president, 29 state governors, about 109 senators. I can't be sure of the exact number of um, reps. House of it's Reps. 360. 360. And I think about 900 um, state houses That's of representatives. Yeah. So it's, it's a big election. It's a major election. Let me start by asking you what do you make of the primaries that have just concluded that led to the emergence of candidates for the various parties, but in particular the two leading parties in Nigeria, the ruling APC and the opposition PDP? Yeah, uh, thank you f uh, very much for having me on your program. It's an honor I, I will not take for granted. <laughs> um, the primaries, uh, the way they went, nothing really changed. You know, we had a long argument on whether to use direct or indirect primaries. The direct primaries will make party members voting, uh, and indirect primaries meaning delegate. Um, there was this long argument on which is more democratic, mm -hmm. if every party member queues up to choose uh, the candidate of their choice. Uh, is more democratic. That is one argument. Uh, and people say, no, democracy representation is also part of democracy. So mm. if you are entrusting a delegate to do the voting on your behalf, it's easier to manage it's, uh, as long as it, it, the, the, the delegate has your mandate. But isn't really this an argument we saw politicians who were sort of il interested in elective office themselves or endorsing people for elective office? That's yeah. what they were pushing. Yeah, the, the politicians, basically, when they are fighting for their own interests, they will never say, I'm fighting for my interest. Mm. They are fighting for the interest of democracy, mm. good governance, and all that. So it was really a battle between the lawmakers, the federal lawmakers, and the state governors. They believe that if it was a direct primary, they will have more say. They will be, can go directly to party members and get their ticket back. They believe that if it was indirect, the governors could manipulate the emergence, the election of delegates. And, and, and in many ways, that has them. happened, hasn't it? Um, that's I exactly what I understand that in yeah. the Senate, for example, we've seen yeah. a lot of people lose their seats. More than half of them not getting their tickets back. So that was exactly what they wanted to fight. But in the process, they also did themselves in when they said only elected delegates. It was later they realized that they themselves couldn't vote. Before there is what you call statutory delegates, mm. everyone elected on the platform of the party is automatic, was automatically a delegate. Right. Now, um, with the law they passed, this electoral act blindsided many people, including the APC that wanted to do consensus candidates, only to discover that in the law, everybody must agree, every contestant must agree to a consensus. Not just agree, must put it in writing. And so you couldn't do a majority sort of consensus. Con so if out of 10 people, only 9 said yes. Yes, if one says no. You had to still go to the polls. I'm sure Hamad Lawan, the Senate president, is beating himself that how did this law pass under my nose and I didn't say it. He probably would have been the consensus candidate. Because the way consensus was done before was they would just hold a meeting, they come out and address the press, we have picked the consensus candidate. Which and they kind of did, didn't they? We that, sort of that was what they were trying to do. Right. But they said, uh, one of the candidates said, well, if I'm going to be the consensus, I will agree to the consensus arrangement. Okay. Now, because this conversation isn't going to be heard by only Nigerians, I yeah. want us to be sort of 
a little bit sort of more detailed when okay. we sort of speak about people okay, so, so that, that they, can, they understand what we're yeah. talking about because we're almost talking like insiders now yeah, that but kind I said of the get Senate president. Yes, I know. So mm-hmm. I wanted to just sort of take you back to this issue of um direct and, direct and indirect primaries. Yeah. Um in the middle of all of this conversation, yeah. I'm not too sure that the regular Nigerian got a look in. I mean representatives will argue that they were fighting for a regular Nigerian. But in reality, based on your sort of experience of covering politics and looking at the way politics work, what system do you think would have best served Nigerian democracy and the regular man on the street? Yeah. I will tell you something. The problem is not the system. Mm -hmm. It is those who operate the system. There is no system you adopt that is not subject to manipulation and fraud. If you say, let us do direct primaries, every party member, somebody holds the register, the party register. And we've seen what they've done with it we before. Where they you just get down your name. It. Your name is not there. Now, we did direct primary in 1992 presidential election, over all the elections, mm. initially before Babangida cancelled, the, the Babangida government cancelled the People, in fact, in those days, we were doing open ballot system. You would queue behind a poster of, of your candidate. Person, yes. And they were giving bread, loaves of bread, sliced with neat notes, uh, 50 naira then. Uh, we call it wasobia. Top, inside the... So it looked like loaf. they were being fed, but it was really money, money. exchanging. And people were and changing people were buying queues, votes. Direct primary. So we, which is... The argument I always make in my column that the problem is not the system. The problem is not the law. It is the human beings that are operating the law. But that, that, is not, that are not allowing the system to work. But, but Simon, part of the problem when you know um, people like me hear people like you talk yeah. is that we kind of understand that in our view, it is the flaws in the system that have allowed a certain type of person to become a governor, to become a delegate, to be in a position to actually manipulate. Um, It might sound like a horrible thing to say, but we don't seem to have people with character in positions of authority. And there's nothing in the way we are currently structured that leads one to sort of believe this will change. So it seems like the perfect conundrum that cannot be solved in our view. And that's a problem, isn't it? Well, some things are changing. Okay. Even though I criticize the fact that we have too many laws. You have experience with the United States. You have experience with the UK. They don't have as many laws as we have. We even make laws to determine how a presidential candidate should speak, the language he should speak while campaigning, mm. the color of the dress. They don't have all those things. There are things that are by convention. So if but those are dangerous, like we've seen. Yeah, we, as, as we have seen. <laughs> but even despite all that, there are still some things we have done to sanitize the system. It's very sad that we cannot police ourselves, and we need the law to police us. But if it's going to get something better out of it, look at the look at INEC, for instance. Mm-hmm. The introduce the introduction of beavers has helped in sanitizing a lot of things. Even the voter register before one person can have two, three, four, five cards could have mm. but now it's impossible mm. because mm-hmm. of biometrics so we can also sanitize the system in a way that it will take care of certain problems so but you think we're making gradual progress that would be your assessment in several aspects yes but in other aspects <laughs> we, we, we are not making much okay progress. so which are those aspects that worry you okay uh, for instance um i don't want to get ahead of uh, uh, uh myself now in this discussion but mm. What is the idea of a placeholder? Mm. What does that mean? If you cannot pick this, one of the simplest things in the world is to say, Simon Kolaole, you are going to be my running mate and you submit my name to Anne. But if you cannot pick within deadline, which one, what is easier to handle? Poor power supply insecurity? 
So let's let's dive let, let's dive into that conversation and, and and I want us to take the parties one by one yeah. APC PDP Labour uh, the new party by Kwankoso and yeah but eighteen parties we can't take them one by well, one well <laughs> we, we the leading parties <laughs> the leading parties what are, what I consider the leading parties so yeah. if you look at the so the APC which is the ruling party has yeah. not come out to openly say that the man whose name they submitted to INEC. Yeah as their VP is a placeholder. But yeah. that is sort of the knowledge out there yeah. that they're biding their time. He's an unknown. He's, as far as I know, is a brother to a, a sitting governor. Yeah. Um, he was not in play at all to at become all. a vice president. Yeah. And um, if you look at sort of the way he has emerged yeah. and the way the primaries went in the APC, yeah. are you surprised that this is where they are, where basically, without saying it, they've ended up with the name of someone who's likely to be replaced just before the deadline for replacements of names as of candidates expires? Um, I would say I'm surprised. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, you cannot be surprised with anything that happens in Nigerian politics. I think the problem they are having is the way... Uh, uh, the candidate uh, Ashiwaju uh, Bola Ahmad Tinubu picked the ticket um, with the support of the northern governors, most of the northern governors. So now a lot of people are hot in the party. Um, we have different power blocks. So how do you now make sure that whoever you pick will be acceptable to everyone? The governors form the largest block in the party. Uh, they will want one governor to be on the ticket. Are the governors representing, and I'm not taking us away from this conversation, yeah. we'll come back to it, but are the are Nigerian governors representing a stumbling block to real democracy in this country? Because I, I, there's a part of me that thinks that they've become a bit too powerful. And... We literally have a question of 36 men if the, for those who are in power, plus maybe another 36 in sort of an opposition party that yeah. is strong, essentially determining who we vote for. Because by the time, you know, we get to the polls, that decision has been taken by these people on sort of who is on the ballot paper. Yeah. But if you also look at the fact that governors also lose elections and their mm. candidates also lose so it should also encourage you that they are not omnipotent as mm -hmm. they tend to be. But if you look at the structure of the country, Nigeria is one country, but you also have 36 countries in Nigeria in the sense that we have 36 states and no governor is, governors are not subservient to the president. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the roles de defined. Now, what does that mean? The governor controls budget. The governor does projects. This gives them economic power. And if you have the economic power, you are also likely to have the political uh, power with you because they are politicians in the first place. Mm -hmm. They are not business uh, men or business women. Now, why? how does that come into this argument? That is why they are powerful. That is why they are powerful. They control the economy of a state they control the funds and therefore they control the structure when we say political machinery what are we saying essentially mm. is the people you have all over the place and these things are oiled by money by money this one gets contract to clean the gutter to do this drainage to supply books that is what they mean when they say political structure so these are the people the same man my grandfather was a contractor in the Second Republic. <laughs> oh, get, he gets he was getting contracts to build the fence to the market, do the culverts there. And they were holding meetings, UPN meetings in his house. And so when, it was, when it's time to mobilize, to people, go to the polls. Every meeting, somebody was going to eat. It was money. Mm. You are going to give people transport money to come for the meeting. You are going to give them transport money to go back. That is what is called structure. So when the election time comes, it's, oh, so who are we voting for? Are we going to vote for Adamu Atta? We vote for uh, Olawoyi, or mm. are we you know? That is how, so that is what empowers the governors because they have the means. Nobody can become president of this country 
if you don't have the support of those who control the votes. So, now that we've sort of established they are indeed omnipotent, you said they are not, but I think they are, right? Um, to get back to the issue of the conundrum facing yeah. um, the APC, APC, I mean, I know you 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 sort of explained it in terms of the internal, the, politics, the internal politics and the blocks and having to sort of trying to pacify people yeah. who may be lost out in the primaries. Yeah. But um, there are those who believe part of the issue is also that of winning elections yeah. and that um, for the ruling party, yeah. um, there is a general sense that if you do not have a northern Muslim yeah. on that ticket, yeah. you're likely to lose elections. Yeah. And yet their leading candidate is also a Muslim. Yeah. And for many Nigerians, including myself, yeah. who, who believe that this country is now too fractured for a Muslim Muslim ticket, yeah. we see a difficulty and assume that that is that difficulty that is stopping them from actually coming through yeah. and saying who the main candidate is going to be for the VP slot. I can assure you that it's not a problem for Tinobu. And for politicians. For it's not a problem. He's going to pick a Muslim and a Muslim from the corner. I can assure so you, you think that's not what is holding them is up? That's not what is holding him. If you want to win election, you are looking at who can help me win this election. Uh, it's not a notion of uh, Muslim, Muslim, all this Muslim, Muslim, Christian, Christian thing. It's not even now when they say Nigeria is fractured. We are jumping, we are skipping a part of our history. When Abiola picked Baba Ghana, King Gibe in, in Nigeria was in 1993, we were well fractured. The issue people, of OIC. Pe people, people would argue though, yeah. and, and, and I'm not stopping you, but people yeah. would argue we might have been fractured, but we were not facing Boko Haram in the northeast. We did not have an armed insurgency in the southeast. We do not have, you know, uh, the so-called herdsmen uh, running rampage across the northwest and the north central. You know, in other words, we might have had issues, but a lot of them were sort of internal, and we don't sort of have existential threats, which mean that now more than ever, unity matters because of the sort of problems and conflicts we are facing. Again, I do not agree. Boko Haram is not a Christian versus Muslim issue. Mm. In 1992-93, it was Christian versus Muslims. I remember Sheikh Abubakar Gumi, the father of... Uh, the, he granted an interview to Quality magazine in 1987, if I'm not mistaken, I said, look, the 1990 election at that time, it was supposed to be 1990 before the military government moved it to 1992 and later to 1993. He said, it's not going to be between North and South. It's going to be between Christian and Muslim. Uh, because that was when the crisis of the Nigeria's membership of was, was at its peak. peak. The chairman of Christianization of Nigeria then was Olubumi Okoye, and regularly they were scrutinizing every appointment of the government every move made by the Babangida administration that is an attempt to Islamize Nigeria. The building, the, the is national... That, it's crazy, that phrase is still, <laughs> is still part of our on. national... Oh, the, na the, for the, the uh, National Assembly, the Senate, the National Assembly, they said the dome uh, looked like a mosque and this is part of the conditionalities of OIC for Nigeria to remember. They said the bus stops in Abuja were built like mosques. <laughs> you understand? Christians and Muslims were fighting. There was a Zangon Qatar riot mm. when Lekwat was sentenced to death yeah. along with, uh, I think, nine others. I, I can't and remember General the number. Zamani. Yeah, Zamani Lekwat was sentenced to death. It was a major issue then. And people were saying, oh, Babangida did not want to hand over. That's why they sentenced these people to death. So your that conclusion, was a therefore, in, Tafua, Balewa, uh, in uh, your, your conclusion, therefore, is what exactly? My that conclusion is matter. that the religious problem did not start today. But because of time, we have forgotten that we were also on the edge when Abiola picked Baba Ghana in 1993. Khan came up with a list of Northern Christians that he was supposed to choose from. They came up with a Professor Shaya Audu, uh, um, uh, Chris Abashia, uh, Bala Takaya, Pascal Bafiao, mm -hmm. who did not have political leverage in the North, simply because they were uh, Christians. And Abiola was realistic. If I want to win this election, Baba Gana Kingibe was the chairman of SDP. All the governors were with him. Okay. So the realistically, though, yeah. um, and, and again, I'm just staying with the, the ruling party, and yeah. we will then you know, get to the sort of main opposition parties. Um, realistically, though, um, this decision that um, 
hasn't been made and that you think will be made in the favor of um, a northern Muslim. Yeah. Um, you think it will not have any bearing on the fortune of the party in the general elections or you think it will have a bearing? Let me put it this way. Mm. There are people that will never vote for APC, even if Tinubu were a Christian. Right. Um, in 2013, 2014, 2015, when APC was formed, yeah. PDP said it was an Islamic party. Uh, I remember uh, Chief Olisametu, the PDP spokesman, said it was Janjaweed, used the word Janjaweed, uh, talking about the Sudanese uh, militia group. So f there are people that will never vote APC, even if they have a Christian Christian ticket. Um, and I think the man is calculating his risks. For instance, as the they no tend to do, right? Yeah. yeah. The Northern Christian is not likely to vote APC. No matter what happens. Yeah. So you think even if we'd ended up with a pastor, Yemi Oshiba Jo, the as current kinda, vice president. It's going to be worse. A lot has been circulated about Oshiba Jo, about how he uh, uh, made uh, the appointments he made and all those things, and how the, he was trying to Christianize Nigeria. So he was not going to sell in the North. As far as I'm concerned, so 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 you you actually think that um, his failure to clench the ticket was very predictable. Because well, that surprised it, some of us. We thought, you know, he was positioned, if you like, because he was already part of a government that was in power. We felt like he was positioned to do well, um, if not get the ticket, but to do well. And in the end, he came third in the APC primaries. Yeah. Um, did that surprise you or did you call it? Okay, let me talk about... Oh, I knew it was not going to be. Okay. I knew very I knew very much it was not going to be candidate. Uh, but let me put it this way. Um, a lot of things happened between 2017 and when Buhari was ill to the point of death. Mm -hmm. And now, and I knew there was no way the president was going to back or Shimbajo. And the easiest thing, you know, there's this proverb that the Friday that is going to be good, you will know from Wednesday. Yes. I don't even know if that is true, but that is a proverb. <laughs> yeah, <it's> a proverb. <laughs> <laughs> now, the last time President Buhari made Oshimbajo acting president was after the removal of the DGDSS. Mm. That was the last time he ever made him acting president. Now, which one is easier? I like to compare mm. to make you acting president for two, three weeks or to make you my successful for eight years. Which one is, 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 is simpler to do? So if you did not make him acting president since 2018, not what, even... What, what do you think was the president's problem with his VP? Well, there are some things we are on air. So there are some things I can't Yeah, but say, you but are the expert. You're uh, the political I, pundit. You're the one with the insights, yes. with the sources, which is why I'm talking to you. Th thank you very much. <laughs> but you know, it's not everything you know that you can say. But yes. with, with the benefit of what I knew, mm. I was shocked that the VP came out that he wanted to run. I was surprised that he made an attempt to run because I knew what was happening. Mm. But I also understood it's not, a very, encouraging, it's not a very encouraging conclusion listening to you about our politics where yeah. it isn't about competence, it isn't about it seems to be about Let me all these you. shadowy politics that are going on. Let me shock you. There's nowhere in the world where you win an election based on competence. Nowhere in the world. It is who is backing you. How popular are you? Who are your food soldiers? Who are the people campaigning for you? It's not competence. There's no way in the world. That's that very competence. depressing. No. Maybe that's why politics generally in the world has gone to the dogs, <laughs> no, right? The, no, but let's look at it this way. Competence is taken for granted in certain climes yes. because they have a leadership production process. Right. They have a leadership selection process. So you, when you have 10 candidates on the ballot... Who are qualified. Any one of them. So it is now the emotion of the voters. I can tell you that in the UK people, people would argue vote, Boris isn't qualified and that neither was Trump. But there are people that vote Labour all their lives. There are people that vote Conservative, conservative all their lives. That, so it's not because of the candidate. Because for them 
So the people usually determine the outcome of elections are those who are not attached, who are not aligned. Okay. People like you and my, 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 my humble self. And I'm going to put you on the spot before we end um, this program to ask you to call the elections. But before we get there, let's turn our attention to the leading opposition party, the PDP. Yeah. Um, the way their own primaries um, panned out, were you surprised? I, there was a whole lot of debate in the run-up to that as to whether they were also going to zone their ticket to the south, um, given that it was expected that APC, the, the ruling party, was going to go with the South. Um, were you surprised that we ended up with um, Waziri Adamawa, the uh, Alaji Atiku Abubakar, who was their candidate in 2019, as also their candidate for the 2023 elections? I was a little surprised, just a little. Mm. Um, I felt the race was between him and Wike. But Wike being the governor of the uh, South, uh, South uh, sorry, State of governor, Rivers. Yes, I'm Wike, yeah. the governor of uh, <laughs> River State. Um, I thought it was going to be a straight battle, tough battle between them. However, by the time the PDP elders, as they call them, called, uh, uh, intervened, the governor of Sokoto State, I mean, Waziri Tambua, withdrew and asked his uh, supporters to vote for Atiko. That was all changed the game. Because once that happened, it was over really for It was Wike. over. Immediately happened, I knew that was the end of the game. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was, I was a little surprised. I still thought that Atiku was the leading candidate and it would have been an upset if Wiki had defeated him. Let's talk a little bit about the mm -hmm. role that um, Aminu Tambua played yeah. in those primaries um, and again I keep asking the question of whether you were surprised mm -hmm. the reason I ask that is that prior to that declaration yeah. at the at, at the venue of these primaries yeah. everybody thought of him as Wiki's person yeah. um, a few months before then Wiki had actually gone to Sokoto State donated mm -hmm. 500 million yeah. you know to the state um, to help them with some of the issues that they were facing as a result of rising conflict. So there is a way in which people now talk about Aminu Tambua, the governor of Sokoto State, as a betrayer. Yeah. Is that like a, a general um, feeling among the sort of political class within his party, or is this just us from outside hearing this noise? Well, certainly, Wike will see him as a betrayer. Betrayer. Why? Um, it was it was Wiki that sponsored him in 2019 against Atiku, putting everything, and Atiku defeated him. So now that Wiki wanted to run, now that the mood of the country is that this thing should go to the south, in the interest of national peace and stability, mm. you can be talking competence, you can be talking marriage, whatever you want to talk. But you are dealing with human beings. And we all have yeah, and nobody says you can't <coughs> zone and still have competence. Right? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, yeah. You no, know, the way we argue in Nigeria is like the more you zone, there's no longer competence. Right. Uh, which is why I made the point that they can have 10 candidates on the ballot. Anywhere, anyone they vote is qualified to be mm. president. Mm. Now, it was the general feeling in in the uh, weakest camp was that this guy betrayed them by not just withdrawing, but asking that the delegates should vote for Atiku. Right. But not just that. There was also the sectional issue with it, the ethnic issue. Mm. That so a northerners in PDP, the northern leaders or elders, played an ethnic card to get Tambua to withdraw for Atiku rather than Wiki. Now, the, the PDP elders, I think, I don't know, I didn't discuss with any of them, they were just weighing the two that, look, who has a better chance of reclaiming power from APC? Um, the, the decision to go with Atiku did present a serious conundrum to the ruling party, didn't it, in, in many ways? Because yes, because they, I knew initially they wanted the ticket to come to the south. That's APC. Mm. But when Atiku emerged, it became a problem for them. Why? Um, the configuration of Nigeria. Mm. Atiku is 
Fulani Atiku is Muslim. It's more northern than, I mean, it's, it, it carries more weight, weight than someone who's a vice president. Mm. So the best APC could present by coming to the South is to present a vice president that is Muslim from the North. Now, if a Northern voter that wants to vote on sentiments, if he has to pick between a Muslim candidate and a Muslim, a, a Northern Muslim candidate and a Northern Muslim vice president, mm. I mean, it's, it's a rational choice. I would, I would rather go for keeping the power in the North. So that was the problem that APC had. Immediately, Atiku was voted as a candidate. And I think that was what led to the the there are some rumors I couldn't confirm that even the victory of Atiku was also orchestrated so mm. that APC could go north as well. Right. No, I but I couldn't confirm. Well, even that. if it was, it didn't work clearly because you know the APC has presented a southern candidate uh, because now. of Tinubu. Yes, if it was on a Tinubu that was on the ticket, yeah. the ticket would not have come today. Okay. To the so, 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 so let's let's focus a little bit more now on um, the, the the PDP because. So Wiki lost that battle to get the ticket of the PDP. Yeah. The expectation was he may then show up as a VP. And then again, now that didn't happen. Instead, we ended up with a VP candidate who is the governor of uh, Delta State, yeah. um, um, Governor Okowa. Yeah. Um, how significant is that decision in your view um, when it comes to sort of um, the unity of the party, because already now there's grumbling going on from his supporters who are not happy at all, and there's speculation that they will be spoilers for the PDP. What have you heard, and what is it looking likely to be? Yes, um, from what I've gathered so far, Wiki is very bitter, not just about the VP ticket, mm -hmm which may be the trigger, which may be the remo uh, immediate cause, is very bitter with the way the primary went, that they played an ethnic card to edge him out. It was very bitter. And that those who played this ethnic card, that APC, they cannot even deliver their states to PDP, mm. that it is APC that is ruling in their states. That So they call themselves elders. How come your state is ruled by APC? or your states are ruled by APC. That is one. It was very bitter with that. Now, are we allowed to know who these elders are? <laughs> uh, you know them. Uh, you, you know them. But, are they uh, what, like the, the board of trustees of the party? No, or? they are generals. They are retired generals. I see. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they were, this were the, actually, they were the ones behind the scenes. Scenes, right. That's minus General Abdul Salami Abu Bakr. You know he doesn't Get engage involved. in partisan right. politics. Yeah, right. that, I have to make that one clear because it's very easy to... Uh, so, so many of the retired generals. Mm -hmm. But even their states are under the control of APC. So, the weak argument is if you are so strong and you, are, you don't want to determine who will pick the ticket or who will be VP, why didn't you deliver your states? Right. When PDP, these same people, these same article left PDP in 2014, Went to APC. Went to APC, destroyed PDP. PDP lost power. And now it is time to come back to you. And, I, and some of us stayed behind to keep this party going. And now it is time for the food is ready again. You come back and they say you are the one that can win election. You are the one that is president that looks presidential. Mm. So the the UK people are very, very bitter. That not just the VP ticket, but even the way and manner. Okay, national working company. But surely the VP could have been used, the VP ticket, there was a possibility of using him. it to pacify yes, and build. Yes, but the elders say, look, this guy must not move near Aso Rock. That VP is just one heartbeat away from what president. What is the problem with Wiki as far as I, these elders it's are not concerned? presidential. What does that, that mean? The way he talks, the way that is unstable, you know. Maybe those are genuine fears. It's also politics because when somebody says he's doing something for the interest of Nigeria, I usually, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very doubtful. You look at the will love Nigeria right? this much. Nigeria yeah, will, will not, not be, be like where this. it is. Exactly. So I don't really believe it's out of love of God that you say that. But that is the reason that look, this guy is not presidential. Okay, so we've heard the governor of uh, Benue State, uh, Governor Autumn, Some you know, come Autumn. out openly and basically said this is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, 
he said that the PDP presidential candidate, Alaji Atikwa Bakar, has to go and beg Wike and speak to him. We've seen former Governor Fayoshi of Ekiti State come mm. out openly yeah. and basically uh, uh, our disown <laughs> 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 the PDP's candidate by insisting um, the regional thing needs to count and yeah. power is um, to come to the south, which we all assume means that he will be working for someone for, else, for someone else yeah. that is a southerner that is presenting a ticket. It doesn't look good for the PDP on that front, does it? Yeah, it doesn't. But you have even left out the Peter Obi factor. I was about to come to that. Okay. <laughs> um, those who have fallen Peter Obi now mm. are people who will not vote APC on a good day. Yes. So most, do you let think... Let me say most uh, of those who have fallen. So okay. they go, it's going to eat deep into PDP's votes in the South. So that's also a problem. From a point of view of um, sort of just being able to win elections... Do you think Peter Obi called it right by leaving the PDP when he did and, you know, going to labor? Or do you, in your view, feel like maybe if he had stayed behind, he might have ended up with the same ticket we had in 2019, which was Alaji Atiku Abubakar heading the ticket and him as deputy? Okay, since I'm telling you some things that I know that yes. may not be out there, yes. Atiku was not going to pick him as VP. And he okay. knew. Okay. So but that conversation was clear. It, it had was, been had. It was, it was not even a conversation. The body language was clear. Even in This 2019, body language that we in Nigeria <laughs> likes to talk about. <laughs> in 2019, mm. they were just a couple right. that were not just... Uh, Particularly uh, in sync. Yeah, that was okay. it. They okay. were not... Uh, there were complaints that uh, uh, they were expecting to fund. Part mm -hmm. of it, that's uh, Peter and... Uh, he did not, you know, he said he doesn't give shishi. Mm. So it did not fund. It was a problem. They needed money. You know, they are not the ruling party anymore. They mm. have no contracts to award. And uh, so they were not really in sync. I knew there were a lot of things Atiku did in 2019 that Peter B did not even know. Right. Yeah, okay. even when Atiku traveled to the U.S., yes. Nicodemusly. Uh, yes. Uh, Peter the B's trip with is, the uh, former Senate president. His uh, running mate did not know. Know that he was going. So, so there was no relationship. Okay, really. so now we've established that um, PDP has issues first because um, Governor Nia Somwike, yeah. who felt he'd done a lot of work in keeping yeah. the party going, yeah. funding it, doing all sorts. Mm -hmm. Betrayed first by someone he funded and then the larger party. Mm -hmm. And now you've got someone who basically brought something uh, to the yeah. PDP now yeah. going off and camping in the Labour Party and yeah. wanting the presidential tickets. Your view is that this will also hurt the PDP? I think so. I think so because the people traditionally vote for PDP. The South is always votes for PDP. The South South always votes for PDP. If you look at the history of our mm. election, especially in this dispensation. Mm -hmm. um, and you think that the, the Mr. Obi is going to take most of those votes now? From what I'm seeing, right. well, seven months is still a, a long period. But from what I'm seeing, people who traditionally vote for PDP are now supporting Peter Obi. And they're saying, this is the guy we want. Mm. Let, let's talk about the Labour Party yes. and the sort of um, infusion of excitement yeah. into what was a party that, you know, was neither here nor there no. by the sort of arrival of Peter. What do you make of his presence um, at the top of that ticket and the way, you know, um, young people are flocking to his campaign? Uh, does he genuinely stand a chance in your view? Um, let me put it this way. Um, he's stronger today than he has ever been in his political career. Uh, for a long time, he was limited to Anambra, and the uh, people pitied him because of the how long it took for him to get justice done when uh, the election the was rigged are, yeah. in 2003, how they were trying to remove him, how they impeached him illegally, and all that. So that was a bit we people he had knew about, sympathy. Yeah, he had that yeah. sympathy. Mm. He had my sympathy. Uh, I've, I've known Obi for a very long time, since 2003. Uh, was I was very close to him. And I knew uh, I knew many of the things that people later started celebrating him for. I already knew them long ago. Now, he had an appearance on the platform uh, and said some of these things. 
and people fell in love with him. Gen- they catapulted people, yeah, him to the national consciousness. That really, really, really helped him. And yes. I know a lot of videos from the event went viral, and um, uh, uh, it helped him. And I believe it played a role in his becoming running mate to Atiku. I believe that in particular because there were stronger politicians in the southeast, mm. including, including a Kuremado. They were not happy when he picked Peter Obi because Peter Obi coordinated Jonathan's campaign in the southeast in 2015. Right. And the votes were not even up to what Jonathan got in 2011. So, so they didn't they, think he had the political they, capital. They, they didn't have that. That it, it, I mean, you know, election in Nigeria, you have to spend money. Don't let us deceive ourselves. Mm. Even in the U.S., you spend money. And I'm talking of legit money. I'm not even talking of bribe. Mm. You understand? Mm. So even doing posters, doing the very moving uh, from one place like to the other, it's right. money. So it was not really the candidate to pick from there, but. The Mura uh, capital was bringing in, uh, oh, this guy doesn't spend money anyhow, this guy's focused. It helped. Now, in 2023, 20, uh, the Southeast said, this thing should come to us. Northern lead, uh, middle bell leaders, South, uh, you know, this thing should come to us. Neither PDP nor APC y- uh, yielded their ticket to. <laughs> Let, let's spend a bit of time on that yeah. because I think it's an important conversation. Yeah. Why do you think that mainstream parties in Nigeria have found it really difficult to present a candidate for the top job in the last sort of few years, let's say since the return to democracy? Is it, in your view, that issue of marginalization, which you know um, politicians from the Southeast shout, or is it a little bit more complex and more nuanced? Yeah, it's a very difficult discussion to have. Um, when the issues revolve around ethnic, uh, especially the Southeast, it's a very sensitive issue that I always try to avoid because you cannot win. There's nothing you say that you can win. You'll be branded an Igbo hater. You'll mm-hmm. be all kinds, all sorts. If you write 10 articles, nine praising Igbo people, one is not in favor. You are cancelled automatically. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing for me to do, but I will tell you something. We went to war in 1966, 67, avoidable war. Uh, it ended in 1970. By 1975, 76, an Igbo man was the military governor of Lagos. He beat you away. He fought in the Biafran army. By 1978, another Igbo man in Dubusi Kano was governor of Lagos. Lagos was the most important state in Nigeria then. Federal capital, economic Some capital. would argue still remains the most important because of his commercial, capital, yeah. yeah. By 1979, the vice president, Dr. Alex Ekweme, was an Igbo man. Number two man, he was pro Biafra. The number four man, the speaker, Emil Zoke, was an Igbo man. A country that just came out of less than 10 years after the war, it will occupy strategic position in government. So this makes it hard for me to believe that there is an agenda to keep the to marginalize the Igbo. The what? issue is, I guess, for the top job, people wonder why that didn't then translate. No, but I, I, that's what I'm saying. Mm. The, the, the North is more than half of Nigeria. So whatever you do, you always factor in the interest of the North. Now the North now has to choose between Yoruba and Igbo when it comes to where power should go or who should they should align with. In the First Republic, they aligned with Igbo. They did not align with Yoruba. Mm. And Igbo had considerable say. In the federal government, the president was Dr. Namdi Azikiwe. The Senate president was Umafo Rizu. Mm. These were powerful people. These were not ordinary Nigerians. Mm-hmm. The, if you look at the cabinet, foreign affairs minister. So, when, uh, so, so the point is, when the war now happened, after the coup and the Alsa officers, my northern officers were killed, and uh, Igbo officers were spared, um, the, the, the premier of Western region, Akintola, was killed. Of course, I think the northern I say, look, we are in bed with the wrong people. Look at the people we are trusting. Look at what they have done to us. 
that is my own. I mean, I, I'm not That's your then, reading. So I can't say I gathered. Yeah. So now, but what, what I'm saying is, they now have to choose between Yoruba and Igbo. Who do we deal with? But Simon, I find it so sad that many years after the Civil War and yeah. many years um, after independence, yeah. that Nigeria's politics are still very much determined by ethnicity and in some e to some extent also, um, I think, um, religion in some cases. Um, it's almost as if we haven't learned anything from the war. It's not a war. Nigerian, I would still insist, it's not a Nigerian problem. Mm. It's not a mistake that when Obama became president of the U.S., it was a global event, celebrated globally. So is it that there was no competent black man to be president? No. Mm. Why has a woman not been president of the United States? Is it that there's no competent woman? Now a woman is vice president and the world is celebrating. Mm. So ethnic, gender, every society has one issue or the other that they're battling with. It's not just but Nigeria. But is, is, isn't it the Ghana, case that our are, own issues mm. have, have become so bad that they're actually toxic. stopping... Yes, toxic. They are stopping us from... So we're not even organizing in a sort of um, civilized way to fight these wars or whatever. The, the, I, I the, personally the, the believe that our, our, our refusal to mm. put our unity, mm. and I've said it, I think, in a few places, to put our unity mm. ahead of our diversity continues to haunt us and ma means that we are not developing in a way that allows us to even take our rightful position is as a leading black nation globally. I, I also want to disagree with you on that. Mm. I'm sorry, we normally agree. I don't know why I'm disagreeing. <laughs> it's <so> okay. <laughs> <laughs> why is Nigeria not developing? Is it because of our ethnic issues? No, I think, it's because, it's, I think it's because politicians have used it. Let me explain what I mean. I yeah. think it's because politicians have used it effectively to stop us from holding them accountable. But even at state level, where it is the same ethnic group, the same language. It never is, though. Hmm? It never is. If you look at your state. Yeah, no, we are even multi ethnic. Exactly. That's but what there I mean. are states that are, okay, let me use a kitty state. Mm. All of them are kitties. Right. So why are they not developing? They're doing better than many. Because of that. It's not, it's, that's not it. You see, this, there are ethnic issues. I don't run away from them. I'm right. very realistic. There are religious issues. But is that why we are not developing? No. It is because we have the wrong people calling the shots, and it has nothing to do with the ethnic group. So whether you bring Aousa as president, Ibu as president, Yoruba as president, we are battling the same issues. The well, quality of the people. The quality of leadership because people, number one, some of them don't even have the competence. Now, those who have the competence, some of them are not patriotic. So they are thinking of how do I take care of myself? Use my cleverness so to make if money. The, the, one of the most developed, the most advanced states in Nigeria today is Lagos. It is not one ethnic group. You see, some sit situations and circumstances at times also cause problems. If the South South did not emerge, the Niger Delta did not emerge as a political force under Obasanjo, mm. we would have got the presidency. By the time they were picking Aradua as the uh, president Aradua then as the candidate of uh, PDP, the running may would have come from the Southeast automatically. Mm. That is the way. But the breakup of that particular region into two. No, the Niger Delta, they were agitating for resource control. control. So they wanted to pacify them. Yeah. And they now brought in good luck Jonathan. Mm. And what that meant was that it took their turn. Yes, I know. So I'm it saying is the they used the to be like seen as sort yeah. of one, one grouping. Okay. So automatically an Igbo will have been VP in 2007. And I can assure you okay. that when that thing happened to Yaradwa, and woman will have become president of this country. Okay, so let's then go back to the issue of the Labour Party and their candidate, Mr. Peter Obi. Do you think he represents a realistic opportunity for an Igbo man to finally take the top job in 2023, um, given the sort of uh, analysis we've done so far of what's going on with uh, um, a major opposition party that appears to be dis in disarray, a ruling party that is going to present a, a Muslim Muslim ticket and which, you know, people would argue may not have much of a track record to contest on. And, and I think we'll come back 
to that as well. What do no. you think? Um, yeah, I I will put it this way. Uh, this is the strongest chance for an Igbo to be president so far. Um, because it's really gathering support mm. across the southern part of Nigeria. I think if he gets a very good running mate from the north, and when I mean good, I'm not talking of the character now, somebody who can win votes. Right. And not, uh, I think it will increase his chances. It well, has there are other factors mm. at play. Okay, before we go into other factors, let's yeah. talk about who that potential running mate could be because there's been conversation regarding um, uh, Dr. Rabiu Kwankwaso, the presidential candidate of the NNPP, which is a fairly sort of new party um, in the sort of political space. But because Mr. Kwankwaso himself yes. is sort of uh, an old-time politician, if you like, uh, has been a governor in Kano State twice, Minister of Defense, um, and I think has um, um, run, um, you know, sort of like a underground movement that has sort of kept him in the public eye when it comes to the North, right? He's... he's, he's relatively popular, I think. There are people who are he talking about... Movement. He has a movement and has had for a while. I mean, I, I, the first time I started taking him seriously, I was in the Mambila Hills mm. many years ago. Uh, I'd spent eight years. I was on a bike visiting some of these ranches where killings had taken place. And yeah. in some of those homes, they had his pictures because yeah. he'd been sort of reaching out through mm. their troubles mm. and, and all it's that. red cap. Yes. So, I'm... Um, how do you see that alliance? Is it realistic? Um, yeah, they're, 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 and could it make a difference to the sort of political calculations that are going on right now with the major political parties? We, we have to talk theoretically on that because at this stage, they can have an alliance, yes, but I don't know what laws govern this alliance. Because you are a member, registered member of a party, and you have picked the ticket of one. No, I party. don't think a merger is possible. I think yeah. technically you can't do a merger. So I mean, that means he will resign. It will be one of them leaving his ticket to join the other on the other ticket, if it were to happen. Okay. Or, I mean, that's the only way I can think that's of. That's the only. So yes. that means he will resign from NPP, resign his presidential from being a presidential and candidate, and tell all his people withdrew, yeah, we are and, now and going to do labor. Go, then he will now be the candidate or he will nominate someone. I don't see uh, uh, RMK doing that. Uh, becoming running mate to Peter Obi. Uh, there's hierarchy in politics and many of them take it seriously. Uh -huh. He was a member of the House of Reps in 1992. He was a deputy speaker in 1992. Uh, he was governor twice, like you said, Minister of Defense, he wants to be president. He was a presidential aspirant in 2015. Mm. He was a presidential aspirant in 2019. I don't see him stepping down to say, I want to be running me to somebody who has all only been a governor of a state. And you don't see Peter joining him on his ticket? The Peter profile now, is so being big. a running mate would be like okay. a betrayer or anticlimax. So we've seen, you've, you've given us an analysis of what a Peter Obi's candidacy is likely to do to the PDP popularity yeah. in yeah. the South, South, and the yeah. Southeast. What is the impact of Kwankwaso on the sort of politics that is going on, both for the PDP but also the APC? He has been a member of both parties. Uh, I think it is article that will hurt the APC the more in the North right. than any other candidate. Um, with due respect, RMK is very popular in Kano. I don't know if he's very popular in Kaduna, or very popular in Katsina, or very popular in Bochi, or very popular in Gombe, or very popular in Zamfara, or very popular in Sokoto. I think his base is Kano, mm. and it's not going to take Kano 100%. He probably take 60% of it or 55% of it. So I think Atiku is what APC should be worried about, because Atiku is the homeboy Atiku is an experienced politician 
He's been at this thing. Next year is his 30th anniversary of appointing to be president of this country. I hope we are going to. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you put it that way. <laughs> People forget he was a vice president that wanted to become a president, but yeah. was thwarted by, um, yeah, by yeah. President so, um, so, Obasanjo. Uh, I mean, how significant. New, and it did, it mm. didn't do badly in 2019, considering that it was running against a man who already had 12 million votes in his pocket. In his pocket, in his, in his yeah. pocket yeah. Yeah. So the biggest problem for uh, APC in the North is Atiku not. Uh, not the uh, the endorsement propensive. that uh, Peter Obi appears to have received from former President Obasanjo, how powerful is that? How significant is it? I think President Obasanjo has, uh, he has reached a stage now that he should just be playing golf and <laughs> leading, uh, you know, dis discussing with the youth. He doesn't have, Obasanjo has never been a political heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Why is foot soldiers? He has letters, so. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he writes Obasanjo letters. Is, is a, he, he has that uh, moral authority thing about him. Mm. It's, it's just like Shoyinka. When they talk, you listen. But how many truths does Obasanjo control? So he, he can endorse anybody. But I don't know how it translates to vote. The people who vote in my village, they don't say, oh, what has Obama just said? Let me go and vote. No. I remember my grandmother. Any time a party was formed, the first thing she asked me, which one is Awolowo's party? Because she was a member of AG. <laughs> in the pre so anyone they call Awolowo's party, even if you call Sadana's party, I say this Awolowo's party. That's the one she would vote that's for. What I mean, she was. I, and, and I suspect there are a lot of people that are sort of still Up very much today, like that. You know, I keep politics. saying my village because these are the people that vote. On the day of election, I will probably be watching CNN or watching uh, Man U versus Man City. <laughs> These are the people that are going through the rain and the sun and vote. Let's talk about the ruling party because um, they're going to be wanting to come back for another four years. Uh, by the time we go to the polls, they would have done eight years. Um, to what extent do you think their record in office is going to be a factor in these 2023 elections? A very interesting question. Do you remember 2011 elections? People were saying, we are voting for Jonathan, we are not voting for PDP. Yes. It was a marketing strategy. Right. I don't think anybody will ask for anybody's vote based on the performance of APC in the last seven but years. But will Nigerians um, fall for that marketing strategy in 2023 is the issue based on what you've been reading, what you've been hearing, the people you've been talking to? Or will it be very difficult for us you are due to actually distance himself from Buhari, especially if you remember that he threw a tantrum not too long ago, just yeah. before he got the ticket, yeah. um, using the fact that um, he contributed to the emergence yeah. of Buhari as yeah. a factor of why he should be a candidate. Mm -hmm. So he's owned it. Yeah. H how easy is it going to be for him to now begin to distance himself? Um, and does he need to? In other words, I know we sort of have this conversation on sort of social media pages. Yeah. But for people who are sort of running campaigns that are that they will try and run based on facts, yeah. is there anything this government has done, for example, that you could jump on and use to campaign uh, as a way of sort of killing the things that didn't quite work out? Or is it really all looking very bad? Um, uh, Tinubu is a politician. He understands power because he has held power. And he knows that you don't mess with a sitting president. You don't mess with a sitting president. I don't see him disowning or dissociating himself from Buhari. I think what he is more likely to do is to play up the positives. We'll be talking about the roads they've built across the country. We'll be talking about the bridges they've built. We'll be talking about what has worked. So now I expect him to be saying we'll tackle insecurity and the economy, that those are the two issues. Mm. Buhari came promising to tackle insecurity, economy issues, and uh, corruption. So I don't expect anybody to still be talking about tackling corruption. Now. I think that's no longer an issue like that. We should just be, well, maybe OB can mm. focus on tackling corruption. Mm. But I don't think Nigerians are, 
there, there are bigger issues now. Mm, there are bigger issues. And, and they are not is. necessarily saying that those issues are down to corruption. And maybe it's even corruption that is causing the insecurity. Right. So we still need to tackle corruption. However, I don't see Tinubu going out there and dissociating himself. Even the VP, when he was making his speech, he was talking about moving the agenda forward. So let me put you on the spot, having arrived at this conclusion, because we are running out of time. I've got um, one more question for you after this. Um, who's going to win the 2023 elections, based um, on your sure. calculations? Um, AAC, watch out for him. Okay. He's a candidate of the masses. And okay. there's going to be a revolution. And, and maybe there's, there's a way in which, by not even talking about those other people who have done a disservice to Nigerians <laughs> by focusing on these big people. No, but uh, to be honest, I... Yeah. I, I mean, I am, do you, do I you, agree with do you believe yeah. that I have focused on the people that are considered the leading candidates? Oh, or have yes. I the only person you left unfair? Out, the only person you left out is Kola Abiola of uh, PRP, right. but I'm just joking. Right. Um, when you talk about people winning presidential power, you have to look at how many states do they even control. Right. A rep has his constituency. A member of a House of Assembly has his or her constituency. The, the same thing with governors. So if you don't even control, you don't have councillors, you don't have council chairpersons, you don't have House of Assembly seats, Where? how do you want to win? Mm -hmm. You will win some votes, but how are you going to be president? It's going to be when you have voted, you have done National Assembly votes and uh, 109 senators, somebody has taken 60, another has taken 40. You don't have any. You understand? Mm -hmm. I, if, I know, if PRP has any member of National Assembly, maybe somebody defected. Not that it won an election. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be difficult to now rate such people. You've forgotten that in the U.S. election, you have... Maybe a dozen people running, but we only talk about Democrats yes, and <laughs> Republicans. Okay, so, but, but, it, it, but to answer your question mm. more, I mean, I was just joking with mm. what I was saying. I believe I I align with people who say that this election will not produce a winner in the first. So you think we we may see the death. first time a runoff for yeah. the first time in the history of Nigeria I, I, a runoff election? I think it's possible, although seven months we still don't know what is going to happen. Going to happen seven happen months. In seven but months. if today, as we discuss today. We the go to possibility, the polls. yeah, because the northern votes will be split, and southern votes will be split. So, having somebody with it, could the middle belt be the decider? Middle belt. Well, when I say northern votes too, I have you not include heard, the I include them the because I expect Atiku to do very well in the middle belt state. What we call middle belt is Christian North. We are just trying to be politically... Yeah, uh -huh. yeah but Christian what about North. OB in the Christian North? Yeah, I believe the Christian North will will support, but they, uh, they will be torn between him and Atiku as well. Right. Because they've always supported yeah, Atiku. They voted for Atiku the last time in uh, okay. 2019. And okay. Let's so quickly wrap up. So do you... I mean, we've spent this whole conversation, um, even though I started by talking about the fact that we are coming... Well, what we're having a national post with other offices being, you know, up for grabs in addition, you know, to that of the president and vice president. But essentially, the conversation has revolved around those two national posts. Yeah. Are, are we um, too obsessed as Nigerians with the center and not paying enough attention to sort of other elective offices across the country and... Is that damaging to our politics and to our democracy? Exactly. We are so obsessed. Including you, Abuja. I who was just yes. a <laughs> Because I don't look at the budget of my state. Everything, even there is more transparency and accountability at the federal level than in our states. The National Assembly, they present a budget, we see it, we now begin to compare, and we now say, oh, they've padded this, they've done this. It happens at state level, but nobody. Have you ever heard of padded budget at state level? Mm. Have you ever heard that well, legislators are doing oversight and collecting bribe at state level? It escapes our attention. All our eyes are on the federal government. To the they, detriment how many of state, our communities. To, to the detriment of our democracy, to the detriment of our development. How many states have you ever had turned down the budget? 
Will it change? It's not about to change because our focus of accountability is only at the federal level. And that is the problem when people are saying true federalism, true federalism, true federalism. It is part of what is feeding it. And that one too is making it worse because every state is allowed to provide water. Every state is allowed to provide electricity. States are doing power projects. We have uh, Aaron, uh, uh, AES, uh, AES in Lagos. States are allowed to do roads. Primary schools are under local government. Secondary schools and primary schools, states control them. States control primary the budget. Primary health care. Primary health care. State, no state has ever been stopped from administering injection and drugs on people or improving the health care. But all our eyes are on Abuja. I had uh, uh, there, an uncle visited me many years ago and we were discussing Jonathan. I said, he doesn't believe Jonathan has performed until the road in front of my house has been tired. And this man, the streets, I said the streets is even under local government, it's under federal government. So I think it's because we had military government in the past and everything was centralized and all glory went to the president. I think we have taken that into a democracy. And so all our eyes are on what is happening in Abuja. To what extent are we to blame, you and I, the media, um, in terms of the sort of limitations of the conversations that... Um, are having nationally around elections and politics. Are we the thermostat or the thermometer? Well, are we the both? <laughs> okay, uh, but the people who carry the p most powerful voices in this country, they are not the journalists. When Pa Ayuade Mbajo talks, millions of people take whatever he says seriously. He's fighting for our interest. When Ango Abdullahi and uh, um, uh, Northern elders and all that. The people listen to them. These are the people that they respect more. Uh, now the Kano has more influence on his followers than a, a reverend father or a governor. So the people that people listen to and trust and believe that these are the people fighting for our interest. Sunday Igboho had professors backing him falling in line. So what point am I trying to make? We have to report what they are saying. You have the media, the media as we have today, everybody has their own outlet. Everybody has a phone, has media outlet. So, and these things go vir viral on WhatsApp. We can play our role, we should play our role, we should focus the discussion, but these are the guys, the opinion leaders that we need to work on to see reason that the underdevelopment of Nigeria is because of in, incompetence and lack of patriotism. It's not because of ethnicity, it's not because of religion. Like Peter Obi was saying recently, when the road is bad, is it Muslims that use the road or Christians? When the price of petrol or, or diesel goes up, it's now 800 naira. Do Muslims buy their own at 500? Do Christians buy their own at 300? So we have been successfully bewitched by our leaders to focus on ethnic and religious matters. And that is what is driving, those, those are the things driving us. We are not asking the basic question. If you criticize me today and I will say, oh, it's because I'm a Christian, that's why you came after me. Oh, it's because I'm Yoruba, that's why I came. And people will start kicking up behind me. I say, yes, this, don't mind these Fulani people. They want to flannelize Nigeria. <laughs> Nobody's looking at this. Why did Kadria criticize Simon? Why did she criticize that? Why, look at it. Why should Simon shouldn't have written this? To, but do you, nobody's going to look at what does, you're criticizing. Does that come into play in sort of your work? It certainly comes into play in mine. And I'm interested in finding out how you deal with it because um, um, I am either loved or hated, depending on <laughs> what I'm focusing on at the time yeah. I'm doing my work, yeah. right? So um, across party, yeah. um, sometimes across ethnicities, ha yeah. has, has that uh, tendency of Nigerians to sort of attack your work based on perception um, influenced the way you work? Or have you sort of had to sort of become very uh, basically deaf and okay. focus on just doing your stuff regardless? I have an advantage. Okay. I started writing a weekly column in 2003. If I'm not mistaken, June 2003. In those days, I'll put my number on the back page of this day. Mm. And then there were comments 
under the articles. So people will send text. My email was also there. People will send email and then people will make comments. And people were abusing me, abusing my mother, my father, my <laughs> wife, everything, you know, depending on what I wrote. wrote. So I already got the inoculation from that period. So yes. when social media came, you were already used not to not one inch. I don't even read comments on social media. But some people still take it upon themselves to send it to you. To send to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was one that was sent to me recently and somebody said, uh, okay, Sam Okarari was supporting Obi before. So when they now gave him money, he's now writing all kinds of things against Obi. And the truth is I've not written anything against Obi. Now, and I'm going to tell you why I, these things don't bother me. I've not written anything against Obi, but they read something in Cable and assume that I write it. The name of the writer is there. Cable has editors. We have seven editors who go through and approve. I don't publish stories. Now, if you are not intelligent enough to know that this writer exists, the editors, why should I engage you? Why should I take you seriously? Mm. It was really the, like the NSAS thing. I wrote an article, one of the best articles I ever wrote in my life, doing a postmortem on NSAS. I said, look, you should know when to to, to you should have called this thing off. Now, when to quarter. fold, <laughs> when to you, throw you the cards on the table. That is the... part of it's basic human thing that hey, I've been part of this. We were in, in the university. You will start a protest from Unilab before getting to Yaba, you will see so some just. boys. Not even mm -hmm. so some boys will just come and they will be picking things in shops, robbing people, looting. That the moment you start a public protest, there must be a time limit. Otherwise, even uh, June 12th, after two or three weeks, the thing will fail because people start saying, are you the one that will feed me? Yeah, civil disobedience. This, this, these people are going to the market in the morning. It's whatever they make from the market. They will use to feed themselves for the day. And you're not saying they should see that to me definitely. So, and I knew the role I played. But that's not for public discussion. Maybe when I grow old, I'm writing memoirs. So mm. what point am I making? And then I understand that people went on social media. I wasn't even trending that day. Now, if you <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the club. I didn't yeah. know you were trying. No, I, I, I was told I was trying. Someone was saying, Oh, Simon, sorry, how are you copying? I said, I didn't even read it. I'm not even reading it. <laughs> but you know what? If you don't know that there's no such UN law that if you, if protest lasts for two months, UN will come and take over a country. Or if you are holding a flag, nobody can shoot you. If you don't know, then why should I engage you in an argument? Mm. You understand? We are not operating on the same level. So there's a lot of mischief and ignorance, the kind of comments people make on social media. People who have constructive things to say, they don't say it with insult. They will point out. I have people who correct me. There's no weak idea that people don't say, ah, no, this thing you argue, look at this, this is contrary. And when I see that, I've been... Uh, because I, we don't I, I, know it all, do we? I mean, know, that's no, the nobody truth. Knows no, it no, yeah. but, but you don't say it with insult. Yeah. If you are even well brought up, <laughs> if we were well brought up, you Nigerian young people song. argue that we use this brought up thing to oppress them. Or I anyway. have a 20 year old daughter. She cannot do most of the things I see people do on the social media. My She's kids cultured. Are not even on social media. Actually. She's cultured. So if people think being unruly is what defines them as youth, they are not going to be youth forever. I was once a youth. <laughs> I was once a teenager. <laughs> so you are, you are still going to get to a position, and whatever you have sown, there's this story of uh, a young man who was telling the dad one day when the family said, Dad, can I jump over you? The dad looked at him and said, your, your own child will do that to you. Of course, it's a story. For the, when the child grew up, the, the, his own child did not ask him, can I jump over The child just, just jumped, jumped over, over him. Over him. <laughs> so I think this is a message for those who think that being unruly, being insultive, being uh, poorly cultured is the way to engage in public debate. It's not. It will not serve anybody. Thank you so much, Mr. Kolaole, for joining me on Quarter to 12. And that is it for another episode of Quarter to 12. Join me again next month when we will be in conversation with another leading Nigerian looking at all the issues facing our country. I'm Gadria Ahmed. Bye-bye.